may be seated. First time I ever sang this song, I believe it was two years ago in Ivory Coast, all right, in Doropo. You have no idea what it's like to sing that song in the midst of about 50 other Avorians, knowing that some of them at one moment in their life or another had really been slaves. Slavery is still practiced in that part of the world. I want to show you a picture of a little boy. See that little boy right there? That's Chris. That picture was just taken uh, 11 days ago. Chris is a young man that Shelly and I sponsor to go to school in Tonda. He's an extremely bright young man. Madame Elise from the school in the village of Neonan that we sponsor their education there. When we ask her what what would be one desire that you think is impossible for you to accomplish in the coming year, but you would like to. And she said to send Chris to Tonda because he needs more education than I can give him. He's bright, he's brilliant, he speaks five languages. As a, third, as a second and third grader, he was my translator when I would preach at the end of the Kids Fest event. I would preach... Ebenezer would take English to French. Ebenezer's a grown man. He's getting married in two months. And then little Chris would speak in Lobi. But he spoke five languages, five tribal French and four other tribal languages as a second and third grader. When Ebenezer would translate to French, he would just stand there and reiterate my words from English into French. When Chris translated... He would raise his voice where I did. He would get quiet where I did. He would put his hand in the air when I did. He would reach out. I mean, he he was amazing. He was just incredible. And so she said, if he can learn English, he will come back and he will change our village. And so we found out what it would cost, and it was certainly very doable. And so, but he he had been a slave. Chris had been a slave. His mother died. His father was killed. He was taken in by his aunt, his mother's sister, whose husband, his uncle, did not want him. He abused him. He would not send him to school. As a five- and six-year-old, he would send him to the fields to work. He would chain him outside his hut at night, would not let him sleep inside the hut, no matter what the weather was. And as a not-quite seven-year-old, he ran away in the middle of the night. He was able to escape, ran through the bush, heard about Madame Elise, found his way and knocked on her hut door, and she took him in. I'm no longer a slave. I am now a child of God. And that smile that you saw is worth a thousand words. He was a little, he was a little sad when he got sent to Tonda because Madame Elise had been his mother And so he was 23rd in his class of 26 in the first round of testing. When I was there and took that picture, they were doing testing at the end of that week. When I came back through on our way to come back to Abidjan to fly home, the teacher who I'd asked how Chris was doing in his studies told Mike to tell me he has moved from 23rd to 7th in his class. He is now doing, doing good. So sometimes if you see me get a little misty-eyed singing, I'm no longer a slave to sin. No, that is a face that I am seeing when I sing that song. Draw your attention to the screen and our morning announcements. Welcome to New Hope Community Church. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. Here at New Hope Community Church, we have a passion and a desire to compellingly communicate the all-sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. If you're a guest with us today, we would love for you to grab one of those Connect cards right in front of you and fill that out so we can get you vital information on what's going on here at New Hope Community Church. Good morning, everybody. I'm Kylie, and I'm on the Grunt Team, which is the student leadership team. I'm so excited for Mexico. We have three more mandatory meetings and adults. If you plan on going, you need to be there on the 25th from 12.30 to 2.30 in the bridge. Be there, be square. This Wednesday is a huge kickoff for us at New Hope. The Jam Kids program is back with one of our jam sessions. 
It is going to be super exciting. So if you have kids um, from first grade all the way through to sixth grade, have them come be a part. We have family dinners starting at 6.15. Come eat as a family. Get to know other families around here at New Hope. And then at 7 o'clock, our kids are going to break off into Bible studies that are aimed specifically at their age group. It's going to be an awesome time. And if you drop your kids off, or if you don't have any kids, we have a place for you as well this Wednesday. We're starting our brand new study, no. The Good Book. So come at 615 for family dinner. Get to know some of the church family. Eat with us. Fellowship with us. And then at 7 o'clock, when the kids go into their Bible study, you get to go into yours and come learn about The Good Book as we look out at over 40 stories in the Bible. It's going to be an awesome time. You don't want to miss it. Tonight in the sanctuary at 6, the His Little Feet Choir will be here to lead us in praise and worship. You don't want to miss this awesome opportunity to worship with kids from all over the world. So we'll see you here tonight at 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. This Wednesday also kicks off our Easter Choir rehearsals right here in the sanctuary. It's going to be an awesome time of singing to the Lord and giving Him all the praise and the glory and the honor. So if you can sing, if you just make a joyful noise, that's okay too. We would love to have you come 6.30 this Wednesday. Don't miss it. 6.30 and we're going to sing and learn the music for our Easter choir, our Easter Sunday performance. Ladies, on Saturday, March 3rd, there will be a painting party from 9 to 11. Come and have a great time with us. There's been a special painting created for us here at New Hope. You don't have to be an artist because you will be walked through the whole process. And by the end of it, you'll get to walk out with your own masterpiece. So tickets go on sale today in the pavilion for $35. That's right, today in the pavilion for $35. Make sure you get them quick because they'll go fast. Our Grief Share program is starting up this Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday, we have an AM session for you to come to. If you want to come and uh, be poured into and let somebody love on you, that is a perfect time in the morning. Wednesday nights, we also have a Wednesday night session. So if you're interested in Grief Share, check out your bulletin for more information. Also today at 1230, our Widow's Lunch Brunch is happening at the Olive Garden. So if you want to connect with others who are going through life just like you, show up at the Olive Garden at 1230 today. Spring cleaning is always a great time to clean out your closet. Prison Fellowship No More Blues Closet is collecting men's new or gently used clothing. Next Sunday, be sure to bring your clothes to the pavilion. There will be a table out there. Go ahead and raid your closets and bring it on by. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us. We hope today is a day where you can connect with God on a new and refreshing level. Now I need your help. We have today, fresh back from Africa, like three in the morning back from Africa. I need you to help me give a big, warm, new hope welcome to our senior pastor, Pastor Tim Rowland. Come on. Sometimes youth pastors, you know, they just get a little crazy on you there. But hey, let me introduce our new youth pastor. He's standing back there at the sound booth. You can see his face. All right. Look at that. You can see his face. All right. And it's not even that bad, all right? I mean, <laughs> looking good, Chris, looking good. Uh, Sign-up sheet is going around uh, for choir. We've got 26 who are signed up. Uh, before I pass them around, here's the deal. I wished I could carry a tune. I wish they would let me in the choir. <laughs> even as pastor, I would be in the choir if I could add to it, particularly for Easter. Easter is the greatest day of the year. It is a celebration of the most significant event in the history of the world. The reason we worship on Sundays is because of Easter Sunday morning. The reason Christmas is special 
It's because there was an Easter Sunday morning. What makes, what makes us Christians is Easter Sunday morning. There is not a greater day nor a greater message to try to communicate to others than Easter Sunday morning. Do you know the largest church attendance in the year? It is not Christmas. It is Easter Sunday morning. If you can carry a tune, I don't care if you can read music or not, they will help you with that. If you can carry a tune, I would love to have 35 in our Easter choir. Good, strong, full, sound. It's amazing. 40, and we're being challenged. I got 40, who'll give me 45? I got 40, who'll give me 45? But I simply say this, without, not, I, I, if you've been here very long, I don't like to guilt anybody into anything, all right? And, and don't do it by guilt. Do it because you see it as an open door, okay? But to stand on this stage with, 30, 35, or 40 other New Hopians challenging people with the love of Christ that Easter is all about. There's no greater experience that you can be a part of on that particular day. I hope you sign up. I right? hope you'll come and be a part. It's also a great way to meet other people in the church and get acquainted with them. It becomes a small group between now and Easter for you, and so it's a great way to do that. The only thing I want to highlight is... Um, uh, tonight's service, 6 o'clock, all right? Uh, little feet, all right? Those guys are good. You wanna, these are children who have been orphans, some of them probably slaves, all right, uh, at one point in their life. They are from Asia, they are from Africa, they are from South America, and they blend their voices together. They do this for a year, and then uh, another group of kids, all right, who've been rescued uh, both physically and spiritually become next year's team. They are here in our area. They'll be with us at 6 o'clock tonight. I'd love for you to come back here in the sanctuary. They will transform this stage, all right, with some decoration and with their joyful sound. It's just an hour, all right? It's six to seven o'clock. This is not a, a long service, uh, but it will do very, very well. Mark, oh yeah, uh, Mark, you're in here. Hey, see, he made it back too, all right? There's our associate pastor right back from Africa. Do what? Oh yeah, he didn't shave. Yeah, he just, yeah, he, he didn't shave, but that's okay. Uh, he looks good. Hey, uh, we took eight. And at 2 o'clock this morning, um, I knew that we had seven back. All right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I did not have confirmation until a few minutes ago. Uh, Lindsay was on a different flight than the rest of us. And uh, she was to have arrived in Fresno about six hours before the rest of us. She went through Chicago and Denver. And the weather, she got home at the same time as the rest of us. We got in between 1.30 and 2 o'clock this morning, all right? Not quite as late as uh, 3 o'clock. The trip went very well. Uh, it was one of the easiest trips physically I've ever been on. Uh, God needed to give me a little humility. So on the last leg of the trip, gout hit my left foot. Uh, it was excruciating. Um, but, but I love medicines. Um, I have some drugs at home, took those last night and this morning. I'm, I'm getting around much. That's why my wife was looking after me, gave me a stool to sit on so I didn't have to stand so much today. Uh, but that, that part is much better. The real kicker for me was the real setback. Um, I had taken my iPad out of my backpack so I could do finishing touches for today's sermon. Uh, and when I went to get it out of my backpack in the garage so I could make sure it was fully charged for today, realized I left it in the back of the seat on the airplane in San Francisco. So my brain is still in San Francisco, um, which required, uh, what I've interpreted that to be is God did not like that message for today. <laughs> And so uh, I went to sleep with a new thought on my mind and uh, this morning finished it. So um, we'll see how that flies today, all right? Uh, but anyway, it's great to be home and everybody is home and safe and doing well. I was handed a prayer request today uh, from Ken and Tess Guthrie. Uh, Tess's nephew, Mark, was involved in a serious automobile accident. He's already been through surgery. They, uh, they do not know if he will be able to walk again. And his wife is expecting their second child. So a really challenging time for that family. Would appreciate you remembering to pray for them. At this time, I'm going to ask our ushers to come forward, wait on us as we have our morning tithes and offering. Would you join with me as we pray? Father, I love sharing life with you. 
It's a great reminder when I get to go to Doropo, Cote d'Ivoire, Ivory Coast, that I get to share life with you there just like I share life with you here. You are not bound in a relationship with us based upon our location. What's important for us is your location. <laughs> are you in me? Do I have a personal relationship with you? Am I, am I a Christian? Not because of the things I've done, but because I've accepted what you have done for me. For by grace, the loving kindness and the generous favor of God for me, in spite of what I've done or who I may be, you loved me unconditionally and offered to me, offered to me your full unconditional love. What you wanted to hear from me was the fact that I needed you and that I wanted you. I'm not bound by time and space. I have been unleashed from all of that because of your presence in me. Father, I pray that the lessons that you have taught us in our two-week journey will not be short-lived lessons. Father, the lessons that pertain to gratitude. As I listened to three high school boys who were taken on an excursion they spent two hours with boys from Neonan about their same age. And they got to experience what it was like to go out and to gather firewood for a meal. And one young man said, wow, I just thought you put it in a microwave and push start. And he learned that we have some incredible privileges in this country. And that he often took it for granted. And so, Father, I trust the lessons that all of us learned will not be short-lived, but that the spirit of gratitude will have greater emphasis in our life than it's ever had before. The love that can be shared in a community under a tent for nine consecutive nights, whether we were from California or Oklahoma or Canada or Connecticut or the Ivory Coast, whether the color of our skin was was white or brown or black. In, a, in an atmosphere of diversity, there wasn't division. There was great unity. I think, Father, for at least those seven or eight days, we reflected who you are. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, distinct, different, yet not divided. All is one. May we learn and continue to learn those lessons well. Father, it's good to come home. It's good to be with this church family. Thank you for the opportunity of sharing this morning with them. It's good to be home with family. I love them. Thought about them often while I was gone. I'm grateful for your presence and your activity amongst them and in our absences. Father, for what you have in store for us today, may we be open to your leadership and your direction. And when we walk away from here, may we not be the same as the way in which we arrived. Thank you for the opportunity of reflecting generosity as we give this morning. Not because we want others to know what we give, but Father, because you were so generous to us, we can't help but be generous back to you. Thank you for that privilege. We love you. We trust you with the needs that have been expressed here. A young man in a wreck had been through surgery expecting their second child. We pray for their needs and how we can help. Father, for John Miller today, we lift him up. Pray for your best, his daily situation right now. Pray for the Baumeister family and their recent loss. Other circumstances I haven't got caught up on yet, Lord, I, I simply trust you. What I don't know about, you are acutely aware of. We can have confidence in you. Thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Uh, I don't know that I can remain seated. I have a tough time staying in one place. Um, before we jump in the message, though, uh, oh, I, look at this. Look at this. This is old school preaching today, all right? I have paper instead of an iPad today, all right? Um, I'm not sure I'll know what to do with the paper, but we'll figure it out again. Um, 
I'm going to draw your attention to the screen. Just, um, I know we're going to have a special Sunday where we get all of our uh, eight folks from New Hope who, uh, and actually we, uh, some of the folks from uh, the Bay Area, from the San Jose area that were on this trip with us, they want to come down and be with us on our special day. So uh, Bruce and May Wood, some of you have met before, lifetime friends of mine. Um, Annie, um, Annie's a nurse and uh, she helped uh, Candace do her first IV stick. Okay, Candace is a nurse. She'll graduate in May. Uh, hasn't had the IV stick yet stuff, uh, but she did 30 of them while she was there. She's going to be a way ahead of the ball game now that she goes back to school tomorrow, all right? Uh, but, but Annie has a beautiful I, I want her and Tim Kepler to do a duet together. I think it just, ooh. She's a female version of Tim, except she's pasty like me, all right? Uh, <laughs> But I just think they could really, really do a great song together. But anyway, we'll have a big Sunday where we, we, we let everybody share and we show you lots of pictures. But I know you have some questions, I'm sure, about what went on these past two weeks. So just a, a, a sampling of a few things we're going to show you on the screen. I already showed you that one. That's Bruce Wood, by the way, in the background. How many of you remember him? Somebody, that's so May. So May has been here two different times, all right, uh, traveling uh, with Mike, talking about 1040i and Ivory Coast. Uh, he is from uh, the area of Tonda, where the other school is, the French and English speaking school that 1040i built. It's a computer tech school. Uh, and So May is a registered nurse. Uh, and he works in post-op, and he just wanted to send greetings uh, back to the New Hope family, and he's got a wonderful sense of humor, and that's some old guy standing next to him. Uh, cool, I hate those pictures. All right, moving on. Uh, okay, I want to show you something modern showed up in Doropo this year. They got an ice cream parlor in Doropo. This is a village. Now, there's about 10,000 people who live there, but I, find I should have set this up better and showed you pictures of the streets of Doropo, all right? It's as bad a third world area that you could ever imagine. And Mike one day came to Lindsay and I and said, hey, you guys got a few minutes. I want to I wanna take you to my office in Doropo. Uh, Mike, what are you doing with an office in Doropo? And I, he said, no, no, just, well, this was his office, <laughs> all right? And I should have known something was up. He was sweetening us up because he wanted to talk about the next project that we could help him raise money for. So uh, he cooled us off, all right, before he heated us up. And it was good. So anyway, that, that's all that was for. So we had a little respite. This is the pastor of a village church that I cannot pronounce. But this is the pastor uh, of the church where I've done baptisms now three out of the last four years. Uh, baptized nine more this year, so it's up to 34 We've had the privilege of baptizing in his village. Uh, it's a village of about five to 600, and he had a little over 100 people in his church. So making a good impact on his village there. And I didn't find out till this year, his home village is Neonan. That's his home village, all right, that we've adopted. And so I cannot understand a word he says. All right, not one single word. He doesn't speak any English. I don't speak any of, I think it's Loby, all right? Um, uh, but we have this wonderful connection, and he is just a terrific guy. So I thought I'd show you that one. All right, next. Uh, Madame Elise. All right, this is the, uh, the master teacher there in Neonan. That's the, uh, on the right, that's the uh, library. Uh, getting good use and things are going really, really good there. And it is a diamond. Uh, this year, for the first time in all the trips that 1040i and Mike Cousineau have been going to Ivory Coast, there were two significant political leaders who came from Abidjan, an 11 to 15 hour drive, to see what was going on with the medical, with the educational, with all the things that are going on there. And Mike came back every time after he would spend the day taking these guys on a tour of all that they do. And they look at this village and what Madame Elise is doing and what we've been able to provide for her, all right, over these last four years. And the one man who was there with the, uh, he's the second in command with the Department of Development. And he came back after he had been there and he had tears in his eyes and he said, he said, I'm from Doropo. I haven't been back here in 30 years. I'm shamed. He said, what you all are doing in the village of Neonan is what we should have been doing for our own people for decades. He asked my forgiveness 
for what he had not done. And he said, we're going to do better. I asked Mike, remember this is all through translation. I asked Mike, because you have to be a little careful there because we're based, they love humanitarian groups. They're not always big on, 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 on faith-based stuff. I asked Mike, is it okay if I ask if I can pray for him? And Mike said, I think so. So I said, well, ask him if I may pray for him. He looked at the gentleman. I, I, it was in the middle of a, uh, of a surgery day. And uh, after I do the preaching in the morning, that my job is moving patients to surgery and to post-op. I get a chance to pray with them, visit with them. Um, and I was in between moving patients, and I was near the pharmacy, and that's where Mike introduced me to him, told him what his experience had been out at Neonan. And, and so I said, Mike, ask him if I just may take a moment to pray for them as they look at what they can do in the future. And so Mike asked him, and he got teary-eyed, and he said, of course. And then he shocked me. There was a chair right in front of us. He hit his knees. He just dropped to his knees. His, his, his buddy, who was kind of his chauffeur, looked at him and looked at me, and then he hit his knees. He figured, if the boss is doing it, well, maybe I better do it too. And I was able to get on mine, and then I had to get on my knees. I needed help getting up, but I, I, I got down. And... I had a chance just to pray for them. And that was, that was a, a very special moment. And, and it's because of what God birthed in Madame Elise when she went to this village and said, I'm going to bring education and Jesus to this village. And she's doing it. And you're making it possible. All right, next. Uh, that's just part of our team with one of her staff in front of the cantina we built this year. That building behind us will seat 60 to 70. All of her kids now can sit down to a meal at one time. And let me tell you, in that shade, the difference is probably 20 degrees. It's amazing the difference that it makes. So we're, that's the day that we kind of did a dedication service. Next. Uh, okay, see the big smile? All right, that's one of the kids that uh, the Sloan sponsor from over there. He is being nominated. He may be leaving the school there. Uh, it's actually the school down the road because he's in high school now. Uh, he's on a list of possibly being invited to a special scientific uh, school. It's for those who are very, very strong in the sciences. He scored one of the highest scores in the country in his science exams. And uh, he's on a list that might get invited. If that's the case, he'll get his way fully funded for the rest of his education. And, uh, that, and, and he hardly ever smiles. He is so straight-faced. Uh, I was so glad I got that picture because his face lights up, man, when he smiles. All right, next. Is that it? Okay, ah, terrific. So anyway, just a small sample of uh, what's going on, but you can be very, very proud of your team. Um, every one of them just did a great job, and everybody came home safe and sound. Um, we've got some humorous moments we'll show you when we have our special day. Uh, Tom Riska, who went with us, he's six foot five, was a former lineman at Stanford University back in the 70s. Um, bad knees, bad hips, bad joints, and you ought to see him do a ballerina pirouette, all right, for a little program they did for the, the kids and the team there. It's hilarious. He's kind of got a tutu on. Um, um, <laughs> So just what in your appetite to come back when we do that, all right? Um, Candace is already committed to going back next year. Uh, didn't know that till the, the last day. She, she wore a, a, a skirt that she bought there, and I said, oh, that is so cool. They're going to love that back home. And she said, I didn't buy it to wear back home. I bought it to wear to worship next year when I come. So that's exciting. That's exciting. Uh, turn, if you will, to um, Matthew chapter 9, please. Um, Matthew chapter 9. The Bible uh, gives a challenge to preachers, and it says to be instant in season, out of season. Be ready to share your faith at any moment. Um, over the last two weeks, with my iPad in front of me, I had prepared for today's returning sermon. That's not what you're going to hear today. It's on the iPad in San Francisco. Matthew 9, I'm going to read the whole chapter. I don't do that often here. It's going to take probably four or five minutes. So if you have your Bibles, open them up. Um, if somebody's looking at their phone, that probably means they're looking at their Bible on their phone, okay? But to make sure, just take a peek. <laughs> Jesus stepped into a boat 
And he crossed over and he came to his own town. Some men brought to him a paralytic. He was lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. At this, some of the teachers of the law said to themselves, This fellow is blaspheming. Knowing their thoughts, <laughs> does that bother you anyway? Please understand, Jesus knows your thoughts at this very moment, just as he did theirs. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said, why do you entertain evil thoughts in your hearts? Which is easier, to say your sins are forgiven or get up and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man, special term, Son of Man, Son of God, God as man, man as God intended man to be, all that wrapped up in that title, Son of Man. He has authority on earth to forgive sins. And then he said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat and go home. I've often wondered through the years why God told him to take up the mat. He wasn't going to need it anymore. Possibly to be a reminder so that he wouldn't forget what God had done for him. And the man got up and he went home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe, and they praised God who had given such authority to men. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew. What book are you reading? It's his book. You're gonna, you're, Matthew is sharing his spiritual autobiography right here. That's what this is. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. He was an IRS agent. <laughs> and Jesus said to an IRS agent, follow me. And Matthew got up and followed him. You see, God comes to those who were paralyzed with their legs, but he also comes to those who've been paralyzed in their heart. And he said, I love you. While Jesus was having dinner at an IRS agent's house, many tax collectors and sinners, other sinners, came and ate with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees, the really spiritual people of their time, when they saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And I think... I don't think I would be doing the Bible injustice if I extended that question just a little bit. Why, why is your teacher eating with tax collectors and sinners and not us? I think we're more important than they are. On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. <laughs> and you all don't know how sick you really are. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You see, Pharisees were big on keeping the sacrifices. They weren't very big on showing mercy. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then John's disciples came and asked him, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom, who's the bridegroom? Jesus. Jesus is kind of talking third person here. How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he's with them? I'm, I'm right here with them. What do you need to fast for? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and then you will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. For the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. You don't mix grace and law. If they do, the skins will burst and the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins and both, both the old and the new are preserved. I wish I could tell you I'd thought about this a whole lot, but I wrote it this morning. During the 8 o'clock service, I had a thought about this. You know what one of the things Jesus is teaching us with this right here? Don't fret change. 
Don't discourage change. Don't run from change. Change isn't a destruction of that which is old. Change is often necessary so that which is old can be connected to a coming generation. Don't put old wine, new wineskins, or vice versa, new wine and old wineskins. When you do that, you destroy both, but when you realize that sometimes change is necessary, both are preserved. Uh, while he was saying this, a ruler came and knelt before him and said, my daughter has just died, but come and put your hand on her and she'll live. Jesus got up and went with him and so did his disciples. And just then a woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years came up behind him and touched the edge of his garment. Um, in the old King James, it says she had an issue of blood and she touched the hem of his garment. I, I don't want to get crass here, but I want to make sure you want really understand about this lady. Ladies, there's a, a couple of days every month you sort of experience something. Imagine that experience continuously for 12 years. No break. Men, think about living with Time for a drink. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> Jesus turned and saw her. See, she, she snuck up behind him. She didn't announce her presence. She didn't verbally express her need. She snuck up behind him, touched his garment. And Jesus turned and, oh, this is so important, and he saw her. Do we see the people in our life who need a touch and who need to touch? Do we see them? And do we respond to them? Take heart, daughter, he said. Your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed from that moment on. And her husband went home rejoicing. Oh, oh no, that's not it. When Jesus, when Jesus entered the ruler's house and he saw the flute players and the noisy crowd and he said, go away, the girl is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. And after the crowd had been put outside, he went in and he took the girl by the hand and she got up and news of this spread throughout the region. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him calling out, have mercy on us, Son of David. You understand that's prophecy being fulfilled? Jesus would come from the tribe of Judah, the lion of Judah, the lineage of David. By the way, that song of the lion and the lamb, we sang that in Africa. All right. There's just something cool about singing about lions in Africa. All right. Though I've never seen one there, it's something cool about it. When he got in, indoors, the blind men came to him, and he asked them, do you believe I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord. And then he touched their eyes and said, according to your faith, it will be done to you. And their sight was restored. If you want to know what really happened that day, ask a blind man, because he saw it all. <laughs> I find that really fascinating. Jesus warned them sternly, see that no one knows about this. If you want word to get out about something, tell everybody, don't say a word to anybody. <laughs> It'll get out. But they went out and spread the news about him all over the region. While they were going out, a man who was demon-possessed and could not talk was brought to Jesus. And when the demon was driven out, the man who had been dumb spoke. Uh, the crowd was amazed. And, and you understand dumb does not mean stupid, right? He couldn't talk. The crowd was amazed and said, nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, it is by the prince of demons that he drives out demons. They were, so, they were stupid. Verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. Please note what it does not say. It didn't say he healed everybody who was sick. You read the Gospels, you know that's not true. But he, sealed, he healed every kind of sickness and issue. 
There's nothing beyond the power of God. Don't, don't ask me to explain why did he heal some and not others. I can't answer that. That's not the thrust of this message. But what is the thrust of this message is, do you see the people around you? Do you see the people around you? When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. Harry Truman. Just, do y'all know who Harry Truman was? All right, any in here? It's okay to raise your hand if you don't. Anybody not know who Harry Truman was? You, it, won't, it won't be a bad thing to raise your hand. Okay, good, that's good. Okay, they're still teaching some history in school. He, he was, a, as you know, a former president of the United States. It is said that there was a particular story that Harry loved to tell. It was about a man who had been hit on the head at work pretty severely. The blow was so bad, the man was knocked unconscious for a long period of time. His family was convinced that he was dead. They called the funeral home and asked the director to come and pick him up and began to make preparations for the funeral. Well, early the next morning, the man suddenly woke up, sat straight up in the casket. Puzzled, he blinked several times and he looked around, trying to put everything together about where he was. The man thought to himself, if I'm alive, what in the world am I doing in this soft, satin-filled box? And if I'm dead, why do I need to go to the bathroom? <laughs> Clearly, the man was a little confused about his situation and his circumstances. Uh, well, as you can probably figure out, Matthew chapter 9 can create some confusion for folks. There's a lot of subjects that we could deal with here. With every miracle that's done in this chapter, there's a lot of things that we could talk about and address. But here's what I want you to know that I believe chapter 9 really is all about. I think Matthew chapter 9 is about how we humans sometimes can be confused as to how we might follow Christ through the open doors that are all around us. You see, what I find fascinating about this passage is right in the middle of storytelling about miracles that Jesus was doing, Matthew tells the story of his spiritual birth. Jesus came to me at the window of the tax collector, and he invited me to follow him. And he ends this chapter with the harvest is plentiful. There is a multitude of open doors to connect with the world around you if we have compassion in our heart and eyes that will see the open door. We don't have to go to Africa. You can go to your place of work where Matthew was. We can go across the hall in our own homes. We can go down the street in our own neighborhoods. And we can follow Christ through the open doors all around us. One of my new friends since going to Africa is a nurse practitioner by the name of Lee. Lee is probably only about five foot two. Uh, she's a retired nurse now. Uh, she spends probably eight to ten weeks a year doing mission projects like this all over the world. Um, Lee is probably in her mid to late 60s. I never know what streaks of color will be in Lee's hair every year that I see her. This year it was a little purple and pink scattered through the black and gray, all right? Um, she's kind of reserved until you get to know her and then she's exceedingly spunky, uh, has very strong opinions. I, I don't know anybody like that. Um, <laughs> I've watched Lee be guarded and kind of private to opening up. And man, did she open this year. It was at the end of our second day there. The first two days are crazy. First day, it's massive setup, getting things organized. There's already three or 400 people out in the courtyard 
of the hospital area just waiting for the doors to open and trying to get that organized. And, and, and then you have four surgeons. And on top of that, we had uh, three other doctors plus uh, Lee is a nurse practitioner. Clinics were set up uh, as the patients would file through depending on their kinds of infirmities or, or, or symptoms. They would try to send them to a certain uh, clinic doctor who would then make evaluations. Is this, is this medication that we're going to prescribe to help them or are they in need of surgeries? Uh, the priority of surgeries, uh, all, all of that. And it's, it's, it's mass chaos, organized mass chaos. And Lee is very, very driven so the end of the second day, our first day of seeing patients and getting things organized, surgeries just starting. She was on her way to her assigned office area where she would begin to see a stream of patients come through and she would be making very important decisions about their future. As she was heading to her room, the eye clinic, I, mean, I can't, can't imagine the people of people who want to come because of visual problems. Uh, we, we had... Uh, optetricians there as well as ophthalmologists who did cataract surgeries over 40 cataract surgeries and literally this is true some of them come being led by a stick okay their family members lead them around by a stick and that's how they navigate all right and literally led by a stick they have no vision and three days later when they come back after the cataract surgery and the bindings are taken off of their eyes and they can see literally see it's amazing. But a lot of them are being fit for glasses, all right? I mean, people who've never done exams for folks are helping people get the right prescription for them. Uh, they get to see when they couldn't see before. So there's also, and, and that place is really packed with people. And it's kind of in a hallway that's difficult to get through. Lee was navigating through this difficult hallway and, uh, in front of the eye clinic, and as she starts to come out, a man touched her. And the man said to her, help me. Lee was focused on getting to her place to do her job, her assignment, and she said, no, I can't. They can. And he replied, why did you say no when you don't even know what I need? Oh, she said that pierced my heart. She backed up. And she did what's so hard for us to do. She said, I'm sorry. You're right. What do you need? And he said, all I need is a pair of sunglasses. I've already been assigned surgery. But where I need to sit, it's out in the sun. And the sun makes everything worse for me until my surgery. I just need a pair of sunglasses. Wow. She told that story and I got my phone out and I wrote it down. I wonder how often in our world we quickly respond because we're busy. We've got a, an important job to do. And somebody says, can you help me? And we look around and say, no, but they can. And we never back up. We just keep going. I think Matthew chapter 9 is a chapter that tells us there are people in the world who are saying, help me. Do we take the time to find out what they need? Matthew 9 is stories about open doors for compassionate hearts. When there is love, the love of God in your heart. I wish I'd prepared. I wished I knew what I was preaching today sooner so I could have asked Milo to sing the love of God. <laughs> when the love of God is in our heart and his compassion motivates us at least three things should happen we should be looking for the hurting in the world around us there's plenty of them we should have a willingness to sense the needs of those who are there and back up if necessary 
and then act with compassion. I will be honest, it's not always easy. It's not always as simple as a pair of sunglasses, but it is worth finding out. There was a, I'll tell that one in a minute. I know I've got to wrap this up here. Um, Three quick things. In this passage, Jesus showed compassion to the unlovable. A woman with an issue of blood, nobody wanted to hang out with her. She was, I'm confident from the conditions of their time and historians of that time that I've read about, I'm sure she was a little cranky and certainly uncomfortable and she probably had an odor about her. Everybody wanted to avoid her, not Jesus. Some people had already made up their mind about the girl who they believe had died. They already had her buried in their minds. A tax collector, who would bother? But they all had needs. Jesus showed compassion to the unlovable, the sinner, the sick, and the hurting. Jesus' compassion motivated, motivates action. Compassion is defined in the dictionary as a deep awareness of suffering of someone else coupled with the wish to relieve it. That's the key part, folks. It's not just an awareness of suffering, but a deep desire to do something about it. The Greek word that we translate as compassion in the New Testament literally means, you're going to love this, to have the bowels yearn with sympathy. Most of us, we want sympathy for our yearning bowels. You see, but in the culture of the first century, bowels was the seat of emotion, not the heart. The bowels. I, 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 that's not that foreign to us. In, in previous generations, a famous quote was, a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. See, we understand that principle. Not much different. But God says, ah, oh, within us there's this compassion And I'm going to do something about it. The woman who touched the hem of his garment, notice two things about that story. His love for others motivated her to reach out to him. Could it be that when others see our love for God that motivates a love for others, they're going to come to us and say, hey, what is it you have that makes you different? Tim Belcher did that to Jim Critchfield. And that's how Tim eventually came to know Jesus Christ. Jim said, I can't tell you all about it, but I can take you to a church that can. And sometimes we might not be able to provide the sunglasses, but we can take a friend, a neighbor, a person standing in line at a grocery store to someone who can. And the second thing, notice that her touch did not go unnoticed by Jesus. Jesus always knows. Has, has the love of God for you motivated desire for his love to be seen through you? Do you notice the hopeful reach of others into your world because they sense something in you that they want in them? Do we look for ways to follow the love and the kindness of Christ to be expressed through us? There's kind of a funny story about Simon Peter admitting uh, admitting people at the gates of heaven. Peter asks the the one man who appears, uh, and he says, "Uh, Sir, tell me one act of kindness you've committed during your life, one act of kindness and compassion that you've done in your life. And the man said, Once there was a rough-looking gang motorcyclist group harassing an older woman, and I walked right up, and I punched the gang leader in the nose. And St. Peter said, When did that happen? And the guy said, About 30 seconds ago. (laughs) Um, Compassion, kindness, don't let it be the last thing that you do with your life. Let it be the thing that, if it hasn't already started, let it begin today. There was an Avorian man, probably in his 40s. It's tough to guess the age of Avorians. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to guess this man was probably in his mid to late 40s. It was on our last day. He came to the entrance of the compound where the team stays, and he wanted to talk to somebody and, and I had noticed him throughout the week. He was there quite a bit. He was there often. Uh, he spoke some English along with French. And so we, we were able to have some dialogue other times. He always had this big smile on his face. I made a bad assumption. Well, it wasn't a bad assumption. I made an assumption that was incorrect. I made an assumption he was one of the village pastors who had come to be of assistance because he was always around. Well, what I found out is he was not a pastor. In fact, he wasn't sure that he was a Christian. He said, I've been coming, 
helping my friends figure out the process of getting help. And I love what I've seen. I want to find out how can I help you help others next year when you come. I found Pastor Paul, who's the Ivorian leader in that region. You've met him if you were here last year when they came to town. And I said, Pastor Paul, two things. He's unsure if he's a Christian. But he loves seeing the love of God at work. And he wants to be a part of it. And off they went. I can't wait to tell you the rest of the story next year. Last of all, Jesus' compassion changed lives. Chapter 9 is all about changed lives. God used a variety of means to reach out and to change. Let us as Christians change how we view people. Let us look beyond and see people with compassion. I truly believe that as God's people who possess his spirit living within us, we should sense compassion for those in need and that compassion should drive us into action. Let me close with a story I just read this week about an elderly woman in India who after reading the Bible accepted the good news of Jesus Christ. By the way, pause, short commercial. Wednesday night, Jam Center's kicking off. Jam's Jesus and Me, our kids program for Wednesday nights for the next couple of months. Offered at the same time as an adult Bible study that Pastor Mark will be leading. It's called The Good Book. This is The Good Book. You'll be studying. You'll be studying along with a companion book also called The Good Book. It highlights 40 of the key stories of the Bible. I can't say best stories because every story, it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be good if it wasn't in them. It's, it's in here because it is good, but some stories are just critical in understanding the whole panorama of the love of God. And, 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 and so if, if one, you're a relatively new Christian, this would be a great place to go and to, to see the thread of redemption throughout the Old and New Testament and how it fits together so beautifully. But also then when us preachers, oh, you remember the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and then we go on? If I were to tell, if I were to say that here, how many of you would know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Okay, thank you. But how many of you would not know what I'm talking about when I tell the story of Shadrach? It's okay to raise your hand, right? I did that because I did that in I did that in Ivory Coast. I was going to make a passing reference to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and and you remember, some people understood English, some French, some Lobi. So I got blank stares three times. <laughs> to the folks who spoke English, they looked at me. Who's Shadrach? Me, uh, to the French, uh, to the Lobi, and I said, dude. Pastor Paul, do they not know who Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is? He looked at the pastor of the village, and the pastor said, no, I don't think I've told him that story yet. So the point kind of lost its punch. So actually, the sermon just got eight minutes longer as I told him Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's story. Um, and I think that was their best eight minutes of the whole sermon, actually. They, they love the story. Um, but that's the good news. So I'd encourage you, she, great class, I think, for you to take on Wednesday nights. Anyway, this older woman in India who had read the Bible and accepted the good news in her own life, she states that when her neighbors found out that she had accepted Jesus Christ, she had given up the world religion she had known as a child. Her friends and family were not happy with her. They did their best to make her reject Jesus. They ridiculed her. They harassed her. They shunned her. They yelled at her on the streets. One day, one of her family members shouted, you are the ugliest old woman I've ever seen. To which the old woman responded, isn't it wonderful how God can love an ugly old woman like me? Yes. Isn't it wonderful how God can love a sinner like me? And he proved that love on the cross and now he calls me into a life of a loving relationship with him and he gives me that love so day by day I can go through open doors and share that with love with those who are around me. He did it to an IRS agent. He can do it to you. He can do it to me. Let's pray.
God, I love you. Somebody answer that phone. It's God getting your attention. I'm going to give an altar call in a minute. You should come forward. <laughs> God, sometimes we get so bogged down and trying to figure out things like miracles in the Bible that we go right by the greatest miracle there is. And that is the redemption of a, of a soul, the forgiveness of sin. Sometimes we get so caught up with an end result that we never are willing to take the first step in the arena of kindness and compassion. I hope we've got a better glimpse of things today. I hope, Father, maybe for some of us here, we won't be blind anymore, but we'll see. We'll see those who need a touch. We'll sense those who've touched us. We will not hurry on by, but if necessary, we'll even back up and say, what is your need? Thank you for the plethora of open doors you provide for us. Give us eyes to see and hearts willing to walk through them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.